Well, Spike Lee, welcome. Um, it's been an extraordinary year in America this year when you think about the election and about Black Lives Matter and George Floyd and all sorts of things. How much do you think America leave, has uh, changed? How do you this leave year? out Agent Orange? There's an awful lot I could put into the list. I know, but so how you leave out Agent Orange, the one who has more blood in his, blood in his hands than any, any human being in the year of our Lord, 2020. So that's, what I, so that's what I mean. When you think about what's happened this year, how profound has it been? Do you think America has changed? Or is this just another year? Oh, America is, has changed. I mean... That's why Agent Orange is still trying to say the election was rigged. And has his co-conspirator gangsters with him co-signing that. But we know he won. But the fact remains, there were still 70 million people who voted for this motherfucker. Do you understand that? Do you understand why they did or how they, how they came to do that? Yes. You think racism just started in 2020? You don't think racism is systematic? You don't think that the history of the United States of America started when the land was stolen from Native Americans and the genocide of Native Americans and slavery of my ancestors? That's how the United States country, that's how the United States of America was built. Genocide of Native people, stealing the land and slavery. So, to answer your question, I'm not surprised. <laughs> but do you, do you think America saw through Trump this year? Did something change in the way he was seen? Sir, by how American can I people? say America saw through? First of all, I don't call him Trump, I call him Agent Orange. And second of all, how can I say America saw through Agent Orange when 70 million, 70 million people voted for him? In that case, there is still a fight to be fought, isn't there? I mean, in oh, that case, perhaps the struggle, not very much No changed. one has said the struggle is over. The struggle continues. To, to find the perfect union of democracy. I mean, it's been, it's been, a, it's been a struggle from the get-go. And it continues. But when, when you talk about the history of racism in America and those 70 million people... Do you, do you think racism is what has driven most of that support? Yes, I think that, number one, numero uno, that Agent Orange, this was reaction to eight years of Obama. And Agent Orange was one of the saying, started that birth of bullshit, saying that my president, number 44, Barack Hussein Obama was not a United States citizen. So this definitely this last four years reaction to having a righteous black man leading the free world in the cradle of civilization. What is it do you think about Obama that so many people couldn't cope with? What is it that they, that they reacted against? Because he did so a, a little man to who's offend a them. My man, you, we don't have to be Fauci to understand this. <laughs> a it was black just man, being black. don't you understand? People still can't deal with there's a black man who's a president of the United States of America. Do you understand that? So we saw you celebrating when you decided, when the, when the media decided that the election results had been called right, first of all, with a bottle of champagne. Yeah, well, that was not champagne. I was there to take still photographs and someone handed me a bottle. It was Prosecco. It was not champagne. <laughs> and that's okay. why when I was shaking it, it didn't fly all everywhere. So I just took what was given to me. But you, you Let the record state it was not champagne, it was Prosecco, okay. which, is <laughs> fake, Prosecco. which is fake champagne. <laughs> champagne only comes from France, the Champagne region. <laughs> and everything else is fake. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the Italians in New York may have something to say oh, about they, it. Oh, they, um, they know the deal. <laughs> but you, you, you looked really spectacularly excited and relieved. 
Do you, do you still feel that? Or, do, or, I, or I was not sort of... the only one. That I saw that in Brooklyn, in New York City, all over the world. There is a worldwide celebration when the word finally came through like four days later. It was a time to rejoice, but here we are, and this guy's still saying <laughs> he won it. You know, these people, they're in some alternative. I'm not, I, I want to say that I didn't make up this phrase, so I'm regurgitating it, but some alternative reality. Alternative, like the lady said in the White House, you know, that we, we want alter, alternative facts. What the fuck is alternative facts? A fact is a fact. There's no alternative to a fact. A fact is a fact. One plus one is not three. And I have a Brooklyn school public education from kindergarten to high school. I know what one plus one is. But as you, as you point out yourself, 70 million people voted for him. He's not accepting the result. So where does that leave America? going into 2021. Is it really in a better place or not? It's a little bit of that and a little bit of this. But I feel much more confident that we got Uncle Joe and my sister, Camilla. <laughs> but I will so, tell so you this, though. If Asia Orange had won, the world would be in peril. And I'm still worried because this guy is still in the White House. He still has the nuclear code. And I don't think this motherfucker wants to go out with the whimper. It'd be just like him to go off the bang. He's going to start another war. What's he going to do? So I hope the generals have given Agent Orange not the right nuclear code switched up the numbers and gave him something he could remember. Something he could memorize. Zero, one, two, three, four. <laughs> Make it easy for him. <laughs> we have to then come back to sort of in what way America is going to be in a better place because this was the year also of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, the whole list. A long, go a long, long list. A long, long list. And may God rest you know, their souls. As as the as the author of Do the Right Thing, you more than anyone perhaps knows this is not something that began this year or in the last few years. This is this has been going on forever. And the question is, will it keep going on forever now, or will something change? In my heart of hearts, I'm an optimist. I would not be here if not for my ancestors. My ancestors, stolen from Mother Africa, brought to Jamestown, Virginia in the year 1619, knew they would die in bondage. But they held the dream that someday that their lineage would see better days. So I will, I'm a realist, but also... I hope that one day that we could all live in peace. So that's that's what that's how we answer that question, sir. But do you think anything has fundamentally changed in the situation that see, that saw that police killing this year to the way you envisaged it and do the right thing? Was it any less likely to happen this year than it was thirty years ago? No, we and saw that. Therefore, we saw that with Eric Gardner, sir. I mean, I wrote the script to do the right thing in 1989. And when I saw that horrific lynching with the knee to Brothers Floyd Neck, I saw Eric Garner and Ray Raheem. And today, black people are still being killed. And I like to say this. Because I really, I'm going to put this on international press. The international press has really started to, has started to look at how black people are being murdered left and right in Brazil. That's not getting international attention. And, and I urge 
your people there and other news organizations to do what is to really explore. I mean, and look, I'm not saying you should take the, the limelight or the spotlight off America, but they're killing black people left and right in Brazil, too. But what, what, what was different this year, I suppose, to some people, was that the, well, the pandemic... The pan, pan, pandemic changed everything. It changed the whole dynamic. Everybody was home. Ask, let me ask, you can ask yourself this question, sir. Why this happened with George Floyd and now Breonna Taylor and, you know, and just go nationally or locally? This thing went worldwide. It was a pandemic. That was the, the really the element that made this a worldwide response to the murder of black bodies in country, in towns, country cities where there are no black people in it, or very little. There was a world demonstration, marching, kneeling, chanting Black Lives Matter all across the world. And do you think that has made Black Lives Matter or will make Black Lives Matter? Does it change anything when white people join the march? I mean, we get, just look at it. Our brother Floyd was not the first black person to be killed by police in the United States of America. So if you, ask, you have to ask yourself, why did Floyd's murder go worldwide, global? It was... The connectivity, if that's the correct word, excuse me if it's not, the connectivity, the, the connectivity of this gruesome murder and the pandemic. Everybody was home. So people took to the streets. It was a convergence. And do you think that lasts? Or, or could it just go away as soon as the pandemic goes? No, it's, it's, no, it's not going away. I think that many eyes that were closed, many minds that were closed, have been opened. I think a large the, part, a large part of the white population, had to look at themselves differently, and how they reacted to the loss of black life. And when they looked in the mirror, they took to the streets and said, "This shit ain't right. It has to stop." Because there's a bit of a backlash in this country about Black Lives Matter. I know you follow it's football. Always soccer. gonna. Brother man, I, there's always going to be a backlash, a, a backlash when people are fighting for freedom. That's not did, new. Did you see? Did you see the booze at the football at the the other day when the players kneeled and the crowd booed? And we have politicians in the cabinet of this government refusing to condemn that and saying, "Well, people's views need to be respected." Anybody that thinks that racism does not and not pervasive in the United Kingdom is on crack anyway. Or has been in the pub too much. Or had too many Guinnesses. So it's not a revelation to say that there's racism all over the world. That's not news. Come on, they're throwing banana peels on soccer fields, or excuse me, on football fields. Chanting racist stuff. So, I mean, it's not new. It's not new. Well, well, that, that's why I keep coming back to the question of what will be lasting and what will change everywhere, you know, not, not just in America, because as you say, this was a movement that went around the world. And we had British kids and French kids and German kids marching for George Floyd. Here's a key thing, which some people might have missed. There were a lot of young people out there. You just said it. Children whose mindset has been changed. They're, they're not going to go back to that. They've been enlightened. So I think that's a big thing. I think that people have missed it. There are a lot of young people out there marching across the world. I don't think it's a fad. Then can I ask you about the films you made this year and how they... How how, the, how they sort of reflect on your your career over the last three or four decades. Um, why did you choose the subjects you did this year? Uh, the Five Bloods. I've always wanted to do a a film 
about Vietnam War and the moral war that took place, excuse me, that was seen through the eyes of African-American soldiers. During the height of the Vietnam War, African-American soldiers were a third of the fighting force in Vietnam. Yet at the same time, we were only 10% of the population in the United States of America. The great, great David Byrne asked me to, uh, to film his great play, American Utopia, which was on Broadway. And I did two short films, too. One was called New York, New York. It was about the, the, the pan- when New York City was the epicenter of the pandemic. And, and another one uh, called Three Brothers, which intercut the fictional murder of Ray Rahim by NYPD with the real-life murder of, of Eric Garner by the NYPD and George Floyd killed by the, the Minneapolis Police Department. So I've been busy. Well, then, can I ask you more broadly about your industry? Because you are still, you know, and this is a good thing, but it's also a bad thing. You are still the biggest, most famous black director in America. Now, that's that's a great thing for you. But are there enough black people in the film industry in America? Well, first, who are of, hitting the top? first of all, I'll say a lot of successful great black directors, so it's not just me alone. And to answer your, your, your other question, the industry, Hollywood, could definitely be more diverse. More people of color, more women, definitely looking for Native Americans, you know, so uh, Hispanics. So mm-hmm. definitely, there's been a lot of progress. I mean, it's almost like a cliche. There's a lot of progress, but a lot of progress needs to happen, so... And and how much do you feel it's your responsibility to make that change happen? Because you've kind of been making it happen for decades. You know, you've employed oh, so I many mean, people. I mean, from the get-go, uh, you know, employing people of color, women, black women behind the camera. So that was that was a uh, that was part of the mission. And and where did that mission come from? Was it from the the start of your own career? No, it came from knowing that. I was not the first filmmaker, black filmmaker. You know, we had the, the Godfather, black cinema, Oscar Show, then Gordon Parks, or Melvin Van Peebles, or Ozzy Davis. So there was a lineage before me. But how, I mean, I've seen old interviews of you, 30-year-old interviews of you, where you, you know, you were, you were, you were so different to everybody else being interviewed about movies at the time. Because there just weren't black filmmakers at that time who were getting the kind of attention that you were getting. Do, do you remember what it felt like? Well, I do remember. I hate. I didn't like being called a black Woody Allen after she's gonna have it because we were Nick fans. We were both in our films and smaller stature. But that 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 comparison stopped after my next film, uh, School Days. But here's the thing, though. I was never in it to be the only one. And so uh, I'm very happy, you know, when uh, when we're able to achieve success in this very, very tough business. And the business is not set up for black people to win. Is it still not set up for black people? I'll say, I'll say yes. Why? I mean, how does that work? It's called systematic racism. Systematic racism permeates all facets of America. Why should TV and, and film be immune, pun intended, to that virus called racism? If I can go and go back a little bit further than that. Um, I mean, do you remember the point at which you decided I want to go to film school and I want to be a filmmaker? Yes. It was a summer between my... Sophomore and junior years at Morehouse College, Atlanta, Georgia. Before I left, the, Morehouse is in Atlanta, Georgia. And before I left school, going back to Brooklyn, New York for, for the summer, my advisor told me I had to choose a major. I said, why? And my advisor said, because you exhausted all your electives. So the advisor said, think long and hard during the summer about 
what you make, what you want to do the rest of your life, what made you want to choose. And I chose mass communications, which was not at Morris College, it was across the street at Clark College, which mass communications was film, TV, print journalism, and radio. And that's where it started. And and did you always believe that the mass communication that you would do through your film would change people's minds, would make people think differently. Was that always the aim? Not from the beginning. <laughs> I just wanted to make movies, you know, and then, you know, it was, it was a process. And as my late grandmother, Zimmy Shelton, told me many times, who lived to be 100 years old, who put me through Morehouse and NYU graduate film school, because she saved the Social Security check for 50 years for a grandchildren's education. And since I was the first grandchild, I was first her grandchild. I was first, I was her first grandchild. I had first dibs. And she would tell me, Spikey, gotta crawl before you can walk. So all that grandiose stuff, I was not thinking about. I just wanted to learn first and foremost how to tell a story, equipment, basic stuff. Do you think, I mean, to go back to one of your other films, do you think we need, or is there one that I haven't thought of, a Malcolm X figure right now in America? A Malcolm X figure? I think history, I think American history has told us that when we put, especially if somebody's black, when we put so much power or give much power to a black individual, then he gets, then he gets assassinated. So maybe it's better, you know, it's not just one person. It's hard to kill, well, I mean, it's hard we've to kill two or three, then, haven't we? we? You know, you had your president. You had Obama. Oh, he, hey, he had more. One day is going to be told, but he had more, you know what, than any president in the history of the United States of America. He just didn't publicize it. But do you, do you get that sense? The reason I'm asking you is, do you get the sense that young black people seek a leader right now that they don't have. I mean, I was, I was in we America in September. I... It is my opinion that the discussion's already been had. I don't think Uncle Joe is going to do two terms and he's going to hand it off to our AK sister from Howard University. Grooming her the next four years how shit works. Well, and, and is she the person who you think young black people can look to? Yes, 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 yes. So let me just ask you briefly then about a group of people I met um, in Georgia in September who were the Not Fucking Around Coalition. You'll have seen them. Um, who think of themselves as the new Black Panthers. I just wondered what your impression of them and what their goals I mean, I don't. You have to tell me. I don't want to, you know, speak out of turn. Tell me what you learned from them that I can respond to. Well, I mean, they were still very much. I mean, they, you know, their their leader, Grandmaster Jay, who got quite a lot of attention during the election campaign, but seems to have disappeared now. They they were still talking the language of a black nation, of separation, of um, of saying that the that they were the inheritors of the Black Panther movement. Uh, and of the Black Panther Party, and that, you know, that any attempts, at, you know, that Black Lives Matter was a failure, essentially, that it wasn't ever going to deliver anything, um, because the existing system could never deliver anything for black people. Well, as my dear mother used to, I see, first I was referring to my grandmother, now I'm referring to my dear mother, my dearly, my, my uh, mother is no longer here. At a very early age, my mother told me, Spikey, black people are not one monolithic group. And that's my answer. Can I just um, very briefly ask you about sport and, yeah. um, and basketball and, uh, and how, you, how you're feeling about basketball right now and who you're, whether you're definitely going to be supporting the same team at the next season? Oh, I'm always going to be a Knicks fan, the orange and blue, baby, till I die. But in this, there are no, you cannot attend a sport. Here's the thing. Some people may not know that in the UK. The governors run the states. 
so that there are 50 states and this, the governor of the state determines whether sporting events can be played. In the state of New York, we have a great governor, Andrew Cuomo, who's done a magnificent job, in my opinion. Right now, you cannot, there are no sporting events can be attended by fans in the state of New York. And I'm, I'm with that. And, and how do you feel about vaccination? Will you be first in the line? Oh, I'm not going to be first. First of all, be first in line. You have to be your first responder. Or you, uh, the, the elderly in the nursing home. So there's many. I'm at, I'm at, you know, I'm not in the front of the line. I'm not trying to jump the line and go to first. But when it's your turn, you'll be there and you'll take it. Yeah, let, let those other people be the guinea pigs. <laughs> <laughs> just joking, just joking, just joking. Whoa, but you, whoa, you, wait, 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 wait. People are looking at you guys. The UK, because you're going to be first. There's there's some skepticism and worry among some people. It's worldwide. Particularly. Worldwide. Worldwide, people are like, a wait and see on this vaccine. But But there have been particular fears amongst the black American community and the black community here as well, actually. And people have been talking about the history of Tuskegee and syphilis and all those sorts of things. So, so, so do you, is your message, take it. There's a reason why black folks are resistant to vaccines. There has been a history of black people using, being used as guinea pigs to test them out. Uh, just look at the Tuskegee experiment where black individuals, unbeknownst to themselves, were tested, were, were inf inf infected with syphilis and not treated to see what that, what, what that effect was syphilis on, on, on human bodies. So black people have a reason to be skeptical. But I think there's so much scrutiny. It will be very hard to, to have two batches. One for black folks <laughs> and one for everybody else. There's been some dastly deeds done, but it ain't going to happen on the vaccine for that Rona or that 19. That shit ain't happening. So as a man who understands mass communication, what is the way to get black people in America to take this vaccine? I look, I, I've already heard that Bush, Clinton, and my brother Obama are going to be filmed taking their, taking that vaccination. And, and black folks think, I mean, we saw... I mean, someone said, uh, you know, all right, we got, we got Obama, but who, who else? And I don't want to volunteer anybody else. I don't want them to get mad at me. But he himself volunteered. So I'm not going to volunteer any other black people to be spokes, the spokesperson. It ain't going to be me. This is very important because I want to kind of correct my statement. It's not just black folks who are skeptical of that. Now, white folks, too. If it was black folks, why why are Bush and Clinton saying they'll be filming along Obama? There is a wide spectrum of people who are skeptical about about the vaccination. Well, look, um, we're we're sort of nearly at the end of our time, sadly. Um, but I can I ask I you a question. Sure. What's wrong with Arsenal? <laughs> <laughs> How long have you got? Uh, Not that long. <laughs> <laughs> but you asked me the same question, say, what's wrong with the Knicks? Yeah. And I would say, well, Not that long. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I ask everybody on this program, um, and they, they answer it in very different ways. Um, if you could just change the world in any way, wave a magic wand, whatever you want. What would you do? Peace, light, and love. Spike Lee, thank you very much indeed. Thanks for your time. Thank you.